so it has been good morning to all of you. Uh, we apologize for the late start, but I believe that we are now ready to begin. Um, so, Rector, Vice Rector, Dr. David Dutton, Dr. Gladia Fanny, and Professor Fred, Professors, fellow PhD researchers, and all attendees, a special good morning to all of you, and we welcome you to our PhD symposium. My name is Uwe Best, and with my colleague, Alessandro Capitan, it is our privilege on behalf of the Graduate School and the Organizing Committee of this year's symposium to welcome you in. We're delighted to have you here to participate and share in our annual PhD symposium. The PhD symposium serves not only to test and improve the communication and presentation skills of our presenters, but it also gives us a chance to discuss the novelties and limitations of their research. And it also allows you to be interested in what the PhDs are, 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 are working on and are invested into. And more so, it allows the PhD researchers and staff to build their network for future research collaborations. And this year, we've integrated the PhD community a bit further by welcoming pre presentations from the Delft University of Technology and other STEMs universities. So to those presenters, we extend a very special welcome and we look forward to learning more about what you're working on. The theme this year for the World Water Day was Nature for Water. And this basically allowed the UN to create a platform for focusing on the importance of, of water. And it allowed for the discussion of nature-based solutions that can possibly allow us to manage the water challenges that we're currently facing in the 21st century, where we have damaged ecosystems affecting the quality and quantity of our water resources that are available. And we have situations such as in the Indonesian case where you have extreme, extreme uh, climate change events such as the tsunamis and earthquakes, and also subsidence that really causes an immense stress on our low-lying coastal areas. So, since we're IHG, which is the largest water education facility here, and we're in an ideal place to discuss these challenges and come up with sustainable solutions. And this year, we're honored to have Dr. Brett van Bessenbeck and Dr. David Zetlin. Dr. Van Bessenbeck, has been working in excess of seven years in nature-based private defenses, and she basically focuses on the implementation of these structures and also the identification of key knowledge gaps. And her most recent project has been the Waves versus Wind project, which has been quite quite wonderfully done so far. And Dr. David Zetlin is an associate pro professor at the Leiden University and he is versed in the fields of economic sustainability and entrepreneurship. He's the author of several books and has given numerous talks, so we really look forward to what he will be sharing with us. And so please prepare as you move forward to be challenged, to be excited, and to be inspired by the presentations that will be shared over the next two days. And as I prepare to hand over to my colleague, Alessandro Capitan, who will introduce our vice director. Please do remember that uh, you can find the Wi-Fi, uh, the Wi-Fi codes along with the web page for the symposium on the cover of your booklet. And once more, welcome and do enjoy our PhD symposium. Thank you, Uwe. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, the first speaker, which is uh, Professor De Fatou. Professor De Fatou has more than 20 years' experience in water management, management for agriculture, and uh, she started uh, her career in uh, the International Water Management Institute, where she worked from 1996 to 2011. She was based in Sri Lanka, Ghana, Colombia. Uh, she worked on several projects mostly uh, related to wet, uh, watershed planning, uh, agricultural uh, irrigation management. She then uh, was also involved in modeling 
Also, in, uh, in particular, uh, the uh, global water demands and supply, which brought to the development of this modeling and its application in several case studies around the world. Uh, from 2012, she joined IHE as professor of the Land and Water for Field Security uh, Group, and she is now a vice director of the Institute. Professor Dr. Kuhn, please. Thank you very Uh, thank you, Absam. Thank you, everyone, for this uh, welcome word. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to uh, introduce, to open this uh, seminar. Um, uh, of course, a very heartening welcome to all the PhD fellows from within IIT, but also from outside IIT. And in particular, of course, our uh, guest speakers of today and tomorrow. Uh, those are, as already mentioned, the Brechte van Wezenbrink. Uh, Dr. Z uh, David Zetland, uh, Vincent Puik, and Peter van der Steen. So, a very, a, a, a very hearty welcome uh, to this uh, event. Uh, I was looking through the program, and two things start, struck me in the program, which is actually quite exciting. It's, it's a little bit different than uh, last year's, uh, in, in, in more than one respect. But one is, for example, there's not just our PhD students in IT Delft, but it's really broadened to a wider group of PhD students, which, which really is, uh, I think, a, a, a very nice uh, uh, way to, to uh, extend the um, research that we do here in IT, but also uh, to introduce uh, research from, from uh, outside the IT. Uh, the other thing that I really liked, there's going to be some workshops. And those workshops is a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, which, as everybody knows, not, not only IT fellows or, or PhD fellows for that matter, but also staff, peer-to-peer -peer mentoring is, is a really powerful tool for, uh, for, for uh, learning. Uh, while you're mentoring, you learn. But while you're mentored, you also learn. So I think it's, it's a very nice initiative. Uh, another one, stress management. I think you can all use that. Uh, not, not only our uh, PhD fellows, but uh, so I, I would say, uh, staff, please uh, uh, attend that session. And uh, data visualization, which is also, you, you see now that in, in many uh, journals, they ask for a pictorial abstract, right? One picture that basically gives the abstract the essence of your, of your paper, of your research. I think it's, it's of course a cliche, but indeed picture and animation can say so much more than just a few words. So I, I think that's also a, a, a very nice workshop uh, and a very nice initiative. Um, so for just to remind of the objectives of this PhD seminar, it's to test and improve communication and presentation skills, uh, to debate the novelties, so I hope there's going to be quite some discussion about, uh, about this, but also the limitations of, of the studies. Of course, get inspired by your fellow PhDs, by uh, uh, PhDs from Team Delft, and uh, from uh, discussions uh, among us, among ourselves. Build a network of IT staff and colleagues, and of course, with the speakers and the outside speakers and the uh, 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 PhD fellows from, from Delft discuss future research collaborations between PhD fellows, for example, um, uh, joint uh, journal papers or, or scientific publications, and of course, strengthen the sense of community among PhD fellows at IT Delft and hopefully also outside there. Now, about the topic. I really have to compliment the, um, the organizers for, for the topic. Uh, I, at first I was, I would say, okay, uh, nature for water, right? When I was uh, working for IT, uh, sorry, for, in, for International Water Man Management Institute, we were talking about water for nature, right? We were, this was like some, some 20 years ago, we were talking about uh, environmental flow requirements, keeping some water as, as, as a separate allocation for nature. That was basically the water for nature. Uh, there was water for, for domestic, 
24 industrial, uh, a large part of course, in the 24 for agriculture, and then, then there was the 24 nature. This was basically, well, still, let's say, mainstream uh, when we are doing the comprehensive assessment for agriculture water management, uh, which was a study that was published in 97, but it started a lot earlier, uh, 2007, sorry, but it started a, a lot earlier. Uh, now, it, it may seem like semantic, right, and, or a, a kind of a, a small wordplay, Na uh, uh, nature for water, but in those, in that just reversion of the, of the words, I think there's a major, major mind shift. And I can maybe illustrate that a little bit with, with one example of the, here in the Netherlands, the signature uh, project, which was Room for the River, right? It's really, a, a, a really a, a big mind shift. First, and in the Netherlands, we wanted to get rid of the water as soon as possible, right? Pump it out, just... And if, there, if there's more, more water, build the dikes, right? Hide the dikes. So it's, it's rather kind of a fight against the water. And that's also what Dutch, well, and quite often you see people say, well, the Dutch have uh, thousands of years of fighting water, keeping the water out. Now, with Rule of the River, it's actually a complete reversal, a 180 degree reversal of that. Basically saying, okay, let's nature, let's 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 uh, have nature have a central part in our water management, rather than getting the water out as soon as possible, keep it and actually uh, make nature help our water management, retain the water, and also create nature in in our water management. So I, I think that is that's really a major reversal. Of, of the, the thinking. And uh, you see that also in, as I was already mentioned, nature based solutions, building with nature, working with, uh, working with nature, and um, ecosystem services approach, etc. etc. Even in, also in my own topic, uh, my own research field, irrigation, you see that it's not only water to produce food, irrigation to produce food and minimize the uh, environmental effects. No, it goes one step further. That's actually to uh, manage the water such that not only uh, <coughs> produces food, but also benefits the ecosystem services. So rather than having a separate allocation for nature, water for nature, uh, uh, the, the reversal is to actually use nature for our water management. And I think I, I hope that uh, uh, we will have uh, very good discussions about this. Um, I would like to thank the organizers again for well, those three things, basically. Is that, well, a lot of things, of course, but the three things I mentioned is the, the workshops that I really think is a very nice uh, um, uh, addition. Then the uh, extension to a larger audience, not, uh, not audience, but also presenters, not only IG, the PhD fellows, but also outside. And of course the topic that I think is, is, is really relevant. And, uh, so with that, I would like to hand over again to and uh, thank you very much and I hope we have some very, very good discussions and in the end also some stress relief. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you, Julia. Um, for the kind words, although I caused you some stress this morning, I understand. <laughs> By not sending my presentation, but I showed up here kind of early to present. Can I use your phone? Your phone? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, nice because I don't like to sit there. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Next slide. Okay, um, looking at floods. So my work is on, focuses a lot on floods. Actually, I was in Indonesia last week where I worked with the government on rivers. That was a bit of a sort of a, a excursion for me. I work on coast mostly. Um, but in rivers, of course, you're, you cannot talk only about floods. You need to integrate with droughts immediately, right? Um, and then what's kind of interesting, we see, we see a lot of interest in the topic of nature based because even in Indonesia, the Ministry of Infrastructure now wants to integrate ecosystems more in their guidelines. Um, so uh, that's a, I think that's a promising approach. So the topic indeed is receiving a lot of attention worldwide. Um, and there's another reason for that, of course, and that's because we find increasing risk, right? In Delta areas, uh, these were some estimates by like World Bank. Um, but uh, uh, we see that uh, exposure is rising because of people moving into more vulnerable areas. Uh, we get bigger cities in those areas. Um, and it's uh, exposure both to floods uh, and direct disasters, but also uh, consequences of this. So damages and estimates of damages uh, are rising, are doubling when we are looking at because of climate change and, and anthropogenic uh, influences, such as subsidence. Well, this is uh, severe subsidence in Indonesia. And um, uh, the World Bank makes estimates for yearly damages focused on floods because that is where we have data from. And uh, if we look at damage, there's very little data actually from what uh, damage is caused by erosion. Um, but we, actually, the expectation is that is even more than by floods. Um, and under climate change, uh, increasing sea level rise, uh, also erosion is going to uh, increase. So we think it will be or not. Um, well, we have many people living close to boats, so sometimes the question is, uh, well, is it close to erosion or is it uh, people living in a dynamic coastal zone, right? Uh, I think those are questions you need to ask yourself when working on this one. So, will green infrastructure offer us, a, or will grey infrastructure offer us a solution? That's a question I ask myself. Um, and I, what you notice around the world is that implementation of grey infrastructure is actually pretty diff difficult. And many areas are not so suitable. So this is Indonesia, this is very muddy coast of North Java. They implement seawall after seawall. Um, but if you want to implement under these kind of soil conditions, actually implementation is a lot more costly. You need to do proper groundwork, right? But then the, the confidence that people have in grey engineering is enormous. So they keep investing in it while they see it wash away every year almost. Um, well, this seawall, it hardly said, took for like two years. Um, same here, great infrastructure this is very much, so small islands in the South Pacific. Um, in sea coast erosion, the direct response is implement a hard seawall. And you see here, I don't know who are, of you are engineers, but uh, if I look at this, the funny thing is that I think, okay, what is behind that seawall? There's a road. There's on this whole island. There's 2,000 people living. Why would you go to hard measures when your exposure of people, you so your exposure is so little? Uh, I often see that happening because people say, well, we see erosion, and then uh, ministries or governments fly in and they start implementing what they know. The other thing, what you see happening here, of course, is this is not really a failing seawall. To me, it's a failing design because it's very steep. The design is way too steep, and there's no basis in the back. Uh, stood for a year this wall. Not the cost. They, they dug out a lot of sediment in the foreshore, which is interesting to mazes, right? Because those small islands that don't have any materials. So they have a design condition, then they start digging the sediment to build the seawall. The design condition is not bad. Will green infrastructure be the solution for all this? That's a question I ask myself always because um, uh, we tend to think it may be, but uh, look at the big planes, man. Uh, tsunami, mangroves need to stop tsunamis. I think if we don't do this well, it can also be really dangerous. 
Um, because uh, look, this is basically what they did after the, uh, well, I don't say the Asian tsunami, but there has been a new one this weekend. Uh, but uh, this is what they did, uh, what was it, 2004? Boxing Day. Hmm? Boxing Day. The Boxing Day, you call it that? Yes, in oh. the 1990s. Oh. I never heard that. But this is what they did in Aceh. So that tsunami, it, it really was the way the whole coast of Aceh, right? People, houses, people, vegetation was completely uh, uh, devastated. But then this is what they did afterwards. They uh, planted mangroves. Well, you see those tiny sticks. I mean, how are they going to protect you against tsunami? They recently, IUCN did an evaluation of these projects. Everything planted then, millions of dollars invested, all gone now. So also not proper methods again. So, this is another green infrastructure project in the Philippines. I always like this, that they keep the same plan them. Yeah, those are the mangroves for uh, disaster risk reduction. I'm like, where's the risk? There's a natural mangrove forest in the back. That they're not there out in the front has a reason, right? So, I mean, green infrastructure is very dangerous, I think. If you do not implement it well, it's going to be a big failure as big a failure as rain. That's a nice positive start of the stuff. Uh, so, to me, the key is a proper implementation. And luckily, we do not have to invent how to implement projects. Uh, engineers have been doing that for really long. That is the post engineer manual of the Army Corps. That is the flood based management cycle. That is the integrated ocean zone management cycle. Now I've been using the integrated water resource management processes you have. There's nice, a lot out there. There's a policy cycle, processes, schemes. They basically all do the same, right? They give you a dedicated process and planning process uh, for implementation of projects. So it says what you should do, because that is where it often goes wrong. People say, see a problem, and they just fly in with a solution, because that is how we're programmed. We like to do things, put things in the ground. So, I'm going to look a little bit. We made this one. We made it uh, together with 25 organizations and 70 people for implementing nature-based flood protection. Um, but you can actually use for gray engineering as well, for hard structure. Uh, to give a little bit of first guidance, how you should do it and how you avoid the most common pitfalls. So what we did is we did this. We made, based on all these planning cycles, eight very basic process steps, and they do what all those, all those processes have similar steps in it, but they are also like a sort of uh, scan your enabling environment and conditions, right? Which help you to you, you take into account what stakeholders, you make a stakeholder assessment, here's financing strategy, but sometimes you can throw that overboard if you're a government, you already know how you're going to finance it. Um, and then uh, there's other steps in there, I'm not going to go into this in detail because I want to spend more time on the other ones, we give you eight process steps, but we also make this five principles. And to me, the five principles are kind of interesting because we are now writing a paper together with, I'm an ecologist actually by training, but I'm writing it together with many engineers, about doing a bit of a paradigm shift in engineering. And we basically say that the paradigm shift in engineering should be based on three things. We should start looking at larger landscape units. So, for example, if we uh, are working in a river, uh, do not assess only an outer band that has been eroding, right? But you have to look at the whole river basin. And then evaluate your options and look what are upstream, downstream effects of solutions or implementing um, uh, And the other, so we are advocating there in those, uh, in that paper, three principles is la larger lots, landscape skills, of course, also with climate change, larger time skills and do scenario analysis for uncertain futures, um, but also to assess, uh, to take into account co-benefits better. So not only look at the direct benefits of your solution, but look at the co-benefits that nature may offer. Um, the five principles that we put in to improve implementation and guidance are focused on this, the system skill perspective. So this actually is the Philippines, it's a river and a coastal zone. Um, I use this picture a lot to illustrate why it's so important that also as coastal people, coastal engineers, what we call these coastal managers, we take into account the river. Because here what you see is basically, you see a sandbar in front of the river, and the sand probably that comes direct from that river. What we often see is that rivers transport a lot of silty, so small, uh, small sediment particles, and in a monsoon, when the currents are, uh, are 
arm or our shoulder, right? The sand is moved down. And then the sand can be positive on the toes, also by the waves that throw it back onto the toes, and you get the formation of these bars. And those bars are always very crucial in coastal stability. In Indonesia, where I work, we have the same kind of bars, but then they're a bit lower, they're tenure like. Um, and they are actually the natural uh, the natural breakwater. So they function in breaking waves. And you can see them offshore because you see this white uh, surf and the foam area where all the waves break. And those bars, they keep stable whole mangrove coast. You have the formation of the, the Mississippi area, that's a tenure plain coast originally, right? Where it's built out by the sandbar. Then you get marshlands and the wetlands to extend in the back, and then, then other sandbar forms. So here, for example, this sandbar is probably keeping that wetland behind her stable, and I've been actually on the ground here as well. So this wetland exists on a very short gradient. There's a little city there. It exists on a very short gradient, moving from salt wetland to brackish to fresh wetland already. So the foam is only salt. So the other thing that these bars do is they keep the fresh water in more. So as soon as that bar would disappear, the wetland would become more unstable, salinity would penetrate bigger in it, right? And often you see these bars, they, they form, here it's broken, but the interesting thing is sometimes they, they close up, and then in a the monsoon the water breaks through again. Um, so as soon as you start changing things upstream in your river, you're going to influence the bar dynamics of this. Um, and right now what's happening is kind of interesting, this is close to where Typhoon Haiyan hit, um, it hit a bit more further north because that low one is about 10 kilometers more north from the city. And right now the city is by a port funded by JICA, Japanese and present agency implementing this big dam there on top. But on that dam, they calculated for that dam to stop typhoons, but they didn't calculate the yearly monsoon rain coming up that river. So right now that city already starts flooding because of the monsoon that cannot pass through the dam now. It's, uh, often what happens in these areas, they, they take into account one process and then they forget the other one, thereby increasing risk by implementing solution, right, instead of reducing it. So, the other most important thing is why do a lot of these projects not end up very well? Because no risk assessment was done. Especially with nature-based solutions, you see it nowadays, people love it, right? It's like the, the panda for people, so they implement it, especially NGOs. And they don't have any experience with risk. They don't know what risk is often, often, and they say it's for coastal resilience or for risk reduction, but they've never done a risk assessment. So that's what happened. I think you guys may all know this, but risk was defined by the Sender framework as exists, and there's many definitions of risk. But uh, it's defined as hazards times, uh, so your hazard exists of your probability of your hazard occurring and the intensity of your hazard times the exposure, so exposure is what is exposed to your hazard, so there should be people, assets, right, uh, behind, uh, that are exposed to the risk. So often you see in the Philippine case, you see people acting on hazard while there's no exposure, so there's no risk, because nobody, did. I mean, if a tree falls in the woods, who cares about the tree falls in the woods, right? If the tree falls on the house, yeah. Um, and then there's vulnerability that they take into account. The vulnerability you have to see, uh, you have to think about: Are the exposed assets actually vulnerable, and how vulnerable are they? And vulnerability can be uh, uh, lessened by, for example, if people are very well prepared, right? So that is about uh, preparation, but also about response. So I can be prepared for the hazard. So there can be an early warning system. I can, I can choose, well, there's, there's a high exposure, there's hazard, high hazard intensity and probability, but I implement an early warning system so I get everybody out of the region, so then they're not so vulnerable anymore. Or, for example, in, you have areas where people uh, live on houseboats, so then vulnerability is also small, and actually risk is low. Um, so it's a product of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. So you need to do those assessments. Idea if it's worth implementing something like So this is another thing we strive for with nature-based solutions and implementation of them, is standardized performance evaluation. And uh, Uwe was already referring to those experiments we did last summer in Delta Alice. We uh, made a willow forest in our Delta flume, and that's actually because of this criteria. 
We had a lot of discussion about this one with the uh, 25 organizations and 90 people. I actually, I advocate, we need to evaluate nature-based solutions in the same way as we evaluate engineering solutions. So that's what I work for, right? I want to fit those nature-based in the way that we test, that we design engineer solutions as well. And I think that will be very helpful because then we can do proper cost-benefit analysis, for example, looking at is my grey solution more effective than my green one, for example, and how much effectiveness do I need in this area, and what does it cost me to protect these people, and I can make a fair evaluation. Um, and I think we are finding that that is possible. So what we are doing is, for example, this is an example where if you look at a mangrove forest and a lefty combination, that could reduce uh, uh, your hazard and flood risk, uh, we can calculate I think many of you guys are modelers, but we are able to calculate the wave reduction part by the forest in front of the levee, and then, based on that, make the uh, dimension, make the right dimensions for the levee, right? So we are finding, for example, that uh, if we calculate the wave reduction by the mangrove, that the crest height of the levee can be lower, which means the base can be less wide. So this is combinations of hard and soft structures, which I think are very, are most promising. But look into hybrid design. Um, so one of the things for standardized performance evaluation, one of the things we've been lacking are those measurements under extremes. So we do this big claims about mangroves and tsunamis. They even make it up to the BBC, which is to me kind of reliable media. But these are the pictures we don't see often. Those were the mangroves, I think, after Haiyan. That's what they really look like. So what we've been doing in the field as ecologists and uh, physical geographers is testing these solutions, but never under extremes. So our models that we're using, like our wave reduction models, our wave attenuation models, are basically validated for the conditions where we have measurements, which is small-scale plume, <coughs> and field conditions where people have been out measuring, but nobody has been out measuring during Haiyan or dur during a typhoon. So if you look at the measurements that we have for marshes and mangroves, I think they do not extend waves of about 20 centimeters. Tomorrow, Vincent Fibes and keynote, I think he has an, uh, one of the uh, very rare cases where he measured uh, waves of up to a meter, maybe, during some Christmas storm. Um, but in general, we, we assess 80% reduction of a mangrove forest or a marsh, but the conditions are not even a meter of water in a wave of 20 centimeters. So that's a very other conditions that engineers design for, right? We design for one in 4,000 year storm or one in 10,000 year event. Um, and if we use those models, what we now see in the models basically, what we are now seeing, and that is why those experiments are so nice, we are seeing that the vegetation behavior may change. So we did this with Mars vegetation, I think in 2014, that's already published, and we basically see regime shift, right? So vegetation attenuates waves. When the waves get higher, that attenuation actually decreases. But at some point, it flattens off. And that is when the, this, when the vegetation that is flexible starts to bend 180 degrees. And this is typical what's really hard to put in a numerical model. Because the bending is not really in. What's put in is a drag factor that is very often used as a calibration uh, coefficient in the model. Well. But, uh, and then it sometimes goes all over the place if you look at the scientific paper, which physically is not possible. Um, so these are our experiments we did last summer. So when we did the Mars, we figured we also want to look at trees, which are a lot more rigid. Um, so I've been working for two years to get this happening because it's, uh, those experiments are extremely expensive, as I say. We did this for half a million euros. We're still working on... Uh, doing all the data analysis, and it has been, uh, has been really new also for us to do this in the Delta Plume. So why do we do this in the Delta Plume? It's because we want to test re real scale, because this type of vegetation, it scales badly to a small plume, because then the flexibility changes. We also want to look at breaking. Is it breaking under those conditions? Um, and we want to, um, well, we want to have measurements under those extremes that we don't have from the field, and if we will not act or not, are not very likely to encounter when measuring the industries, because there are conditions that don't occur so often, but when it really matters. Um, here we build a willow forest of 40 meters long. What you see are the top of the trees here. So there's a 
one and a half meters ten, and then the canopy is about five meters high on top of that. So you see the waves moving to the top. Um, let's see why I can start it. Always tricky putting videos in your presentation. Never do it. I, I never do it, but. <laughs> Next. Yeah, it's going to work. Really, it's going to happen. There it goes. And look at the, at the branches, what they do. They bend, they're completely gone, and whoop, there they come back. And it's, they look really flexible now, but when you walk through the forest in the flume, they were like, those branches are thick wooden branches like this. So they showed flexibility that I've never expected, um, and I would expect them to break, but they didn't. And the first results look good. Uh, well, I want to say look kind of promising. We had a lot of issues with those wave gauges and the whole rule uh, and, uh, cal and uh, calibrating these. Um, but uh, they, you see attenuation by the forest. But it's only 40 meters. So what we see is when your wavelength becomes a lot longer, and when that's always in the experiments, when your wave becomes higher and your length longer, then when your length is longer than the forest you constructed, the effect is really hard to measure. That's why I want to redo it with mangrove and have a longer product so that we can be higher with the Future future. Um, this is what we use it for. This is the model that was actually made for the north part, uh, part of the group for the river program, where they implemented in Nellis a willow levy combination. And based on that very simple swan model, swan vegetation, uh, where you see the waves, uh, they start at one meter, the gray line on top is without vegetation, and the other lines are with vegetation. What's kind of interesting, you see the waves with incoming different wave heights get attenuated by a forest all to about 10 centimeters, right? So a wide range of wave heights, but to move to a forest, you get like a single value out. This is for engineering design kind of interesting. Although I think our experiments now, we still do have to validate model and then scale up from our initial results. But this, I think in the model, we may be a bit overestimating the effect of vegetation, actually. Yeah, have to take a closer look at this. Well, and basically what we want is finally to have these validated models to inform those different designs in the future. Um, four, very important for me. Also, in the five principles, is the integration with ecosystem conservation and restoration. Also important for you guys when you work on these things, ecosystem restoration and conservation is a whole field in this area. A whole field of research and science. Um, there are like multiple books written about it. Um, and it, uh, it basically uh, is, is not this, this is not ecosystem restoration. This is planting of mangroves in the wrong location because they planted them in a seagrass bed. I mean, seagrass and mangroves are bordering habitats, they are not overlapping. Um, so by doing this, they actually do damaging effects to another very important habitat, but that is not the, pet, the panda of coastal conservation. Because seagrasses are usually subtidal, below the water, people, I don't know, they don't like them as much as mangroves. They are not so easy to plant, they are, they are more difficult to understand. I mean, mangroves are weeds, right? As soon as the conditions are right, they grow. So the, it's funny that we start planting them all over, because they are the weed of uh, coastal marine ecosystems. So seagrass is not. Seagrasses are sensitive to pollution, to nutrients, right? So they need to be nourished and, and conserved better. And what do we do? We start planting mangroves over there. Plus, I mean, so the ecological value of seagrass, many people uh, in those countries, they eat fish, shellfish, all come from the seagrass in part of their life. Also from the mangrove, but the, those, those animals need both. Um, then they plant once, one species, so monoculture, also not natural, no natural value in it, and it's a wrong species because if you would plant a species, start with a pioneer. Ecosystems follow a successional sequence, right? They start with a species that makes the environment ready for the next one. This is the next one, not the first. But everybody plants it because it's a shape that you can 
and just sleeping in huts. And then every day he will like, you've done something really cool for me. Up, still, so I will bet. Ecosystem restoration, proper ecosystem restoration, think about this. You make an assessment, you look what ecosystem used to be there, what is the reason that it's gone or degraded, right, or not healthy. Um, and then you try, and those reasons are often the abiotic conditions. They can be biotic, but then it's because of grazing, right, or competitional pressure, or people have been uh, catching one species of fish out of it. That's the main grazer of algae in the system or that actually causes another species to become more abundant. Um, but most things are abiotic, so the conditions are not right for that ecosystem, either because of anthropogenic effects or just because it is changing. So with coastal erosion, it may become deeper, the waves become higher, so it's not a good habitat for mangroves anymore. Um, so here, that, these are uh, this is our project we do in Indonesia. What we, we construct there is permeable dams, it's permeable to minimize reflection, so waves get attenuated, but they're not, they're not reflecting. Um, and those create, create still water conditions for sediment to, to precipitate, so that the right elevation is reached. And then the mangroves, you see the seedlings there, they come in naturally. That's the philosophy of that project. This is the Mississippi River, where they made big diversions. I already heard somebody mentioning reconnecting rivers to floodplains, for example, right? So in river management, we often actually cut off rivers from the flood bed. And now we start experiencing the, the consequences of it, which is basically that we are getting the sediment also out of our, our coastal lands. So even with subsidence and sea level rise, those lands are not accreting anymore. And here in the Mississippi, they're finding that they're losing so much wetlands that they start to reconnect the river to the wetland system. So they have, are actually opening up the main channel in many areas, and putting back the river in the wetland system where they want to have it, so not down in the Gulf of Mexico somewhere, but closer to the city of New Orleans, for example. And this is the consequence. So these are diversions, and they actually build up new marshland. Um, final principle, adaptive management. Um, actually also important for gray engineering, uh, but often what happens in the world, we implement a project, then everybody runs away, right? Um, well, then the, the, the thing is, I think we shouldn't implement it and run away because we don't burn either. And uh, often then it starts failing, but there's nobody there to notice early on and, or early on. So it's always about learning, adapt, uh, mon start monitoring if you implement, evaluate what's happening, and if it is ha something is happening that's not in the right directive, right? And if you're not meeting your targets, if it's that, then you adapt and start doing something different or implementing another action. So uh, this is, uh, I think this is basically important for a lot of governments who start realizing that as soon as you start managing your river or your coast, it's a never-ending process. And you need to have a certain, that is what we arrange in Netherlands at least, is you need to have a certain allocation of budget to do this. So, for the future, I think the challenges on MES is how to plan it well. I saw there's a nice presentation there in the next session on uh, Dutch Delta management, which is a lot about uh, planning uh, uh, the Dutch Delta uh, approach or something. It's, uh, um, but, but planning is, so, is really important and, uh, and do your assessments properly uh, before, uh, well, on how you're going to do that, right? Uh, design, construct, maintain, how, how do we do that? Because even if we can design a little bit with nature-based solutions, who is going to maintain that mangrove forest? Who is responsible for it? Who is owning it? Will it be the mainstream public work? So a lot of more like uh, governance questions, institutional questions, will arise for MBS that we did not cover yet. If we're talking about the and river and coastal. Uh, for me it's really important how to scale up. Can we really scale up the solution? So if we if we see MBS as doing planting, or if we see it as doing a, implementing a reef ball somewhere for reef restoration, right? This is never going to be something that's large scale really going to make a difference. So I think a lot of it is in proper conservation of the ecosystems that we still have, and in man managing that they stay and remain healthy. Rounding up, to me the answers are in engineering at larger landscape scales, 
um, actually basically working towards sustainable land use management. That is what we should start doing both upstream and downstream uh, in coastal areas. And I think uh, to find models for that with like population pressure that is enormous in a lot of countries that's increasing and then how to sustainably manage these areas um, and how to sustainably manage the rural and not to sort of how do you say push the consequences of urban to rural areas what you see happening in some areas right we have the money to defend or to protect an urban area but then the erosion is hitting in the rural uh, how we will do that in the future learning by doing so that's uh, that's the management and then uh, yeah, transdisciplinary collaboration which is challenging uh, still in the also but uh, if we want to do MDS well, you cannot do it only as ecologists. We need to work together with ecologists and engineers and uh, probably also managers, uh, institutional people, uh, maybe the whole communities more there also for uh, management and for understanding uh, of how these solutions work and what they do um, compared to great solutions. In Poland. This year we have included a theme session called Implementation Bridging Science with Implementation. And this session was, uh, was basically created so that we can have examples such as, as what she has presented that, have, uh, that create a connection between the research, the research projects that we're all interested in and how we can actually implement them in the field and what are some of the common errors that happen and some of the things that we can take into consideration. So, thank you for your presentation and now we open up to a time of questions. So if you have any burning questions that you would like to ask Brenda, I'm sure she will be willing to answer them. And we have a throw box, so we're going to have some, <coughs> some, some fun to possibly wake up. <laughs> Uh, so, if you do have any questions, just indicate and go through the box. <laughs> yeah, yes, thank you very much for uh, the very inspiring presentation. And um, so, you respond quite in a nice picture, you spoke quite some not so well designed. where you are in the world at that point. I think it's a good question because um, yeah. and it's also good for me to consider maybe I should have presented like success stories. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it's interesting. Uh, I think I think each country goes through their own cycle. So what I I notice is uh, people are not blind, right? So I think uh, we have in the Netherlands some success stories also of the project where we try to really integrate nature and to collaborate with different disciplines. And I think those work well. And I see uh, I think other countries go through that cycle and I know this what I didn't know because I went in the news about things. I was like, are they because they really want to implement it in their guidelines for river management, you know, we have to change the solution. Like are they ready for that? So I I was only wondering that to test the ground. But they really are, and they are uh, off the record. They tell you, like I say, they, they are not blind, but they have uh, their governance. Their governance is a bit different. They need to so much uh, infrastructure, high infrastructure, 
uh, imams in the now, right? So you build, 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 so you the things that you call them for building, build. Um, so they, the, their targets are building, 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 but the, of what the engineers doing the work, they see that they keep coming back to the same place, hardening, keeping their abandonment in the same outer bend of the river each year. Um, but then they say, so then they start thinking about themselves and they they said to me, so we think we, we, I can better reallocate that road and put it somewhere else. Um, but it's not allowed yet by their regulation. And that is what, because the road is there and when it's there, you're, and so they put in your vetment to protect the road, while the vetment, they have to protect the work and it's a lot more costly. So the cost benefit would not be positive, but they don't do that kind of assessment. But they start noticing and they want to change, but now it needs to be changed on another level. So I think the process does take time, but they, they are happening. I think I find really interesting. And, and for me, it's more like if the process for implementing gray infrastructure is not working well, and they ask me, so you come and you tell us how to do soft, I cannot. The process needs to be right for gray, and then you can start <coughs> for soft too. Or you can do that. I'm trying to do it better now. Thank you, Rob. I got it already. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, not to me. <laughs> no, no, no. no, no. Uh, it's a very elegant solution, which you may give as a solution to that. It's a very soft, it's not a problem to solve. And now we will create an ideal world. But on the other hand, we are, I mean, independent, or something like that. We have a huge heritage of lots of nations. So are you pleading for complete real reorganization of our landscape? Because that would be in the end possible, but it would be really that we really did the image of the design because it's good to use the power of yours, but we also have to use the heritage that we have and culture that we have. Uh, what's your opinion? So I think that, so for me really, I mean, you can do this small scale, foreshore, land combination, right? But the, the, the big wins are in the different way of doing it. Start to design, start to engineer, start to design. For a really then make it for the landscape model, blah, 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 that cannot deal with large scale or long term developments. You have to put the background box on it, it will be all kinds of negligent things. So I think the most important is to do it right where we still, because there's many, in many countries, there's many pristine river areas. But they move in with these sets of measures that are very focused on straight in the river, no major banks. And they don't do the assessment to see if they need it. And so for, for me, the first thing is where we now intervene, do it in a different way. And use proper assessments and, and have a different mindset in doing that. That's the first thing. And then I think for cities, it will be different because exposure is so high, there's high GDP. So you can always afford to do big gray schemes in protecting protection measures for cities. So the, the problem may not be in those cities, yeah, they, there will be problems if, if it's really unsustainable in the long term, right? Um, so so you have to tackle the source. And in Jakarta, I mean, it's possible to protect, have a protective system in Jakarta, but not if you uh, keep on being around the nation side, so it would have been for the same needs. It's possible, but not for the long term future. So we know which problems to tackle first, right? I think we have time for just one more question. Otherwise, just one more. I'm, uh, I'm curious uh, about uh, the, 
the engineers and, uh, and the sand banks, and I've seen plans for a you know, project of, of strengthening those by nourishment and so on. Has it actually been done anywhere? And uh, how, how, how do you rate the, the chance of success? Yeah, so, so we did. I've been trying to push it in Vietnam, but uh, they said, okay, so they show me the example. You also Northland of Kenya. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, I don't know how well you understand their dynamics in Vietnam. But I have to say in this system, we don't understand the long-term dynamics of the Kenya. So they were gone and, and also this area has turned out to be more heavily society than we figure. Because uh, it's, it's rural, so we figure society is not just a fear, but it turns out that the atmosphere that is is Maram is underneath the area. So it's also subsiding, but it's just going slower still because of the damage of the battle. And uh, so look, we figure those veneers are subsiding also. Uh, so it depends on the input of sand, whether they can keep up. And in the beginning it looked like they weren't keeping up, but last year there was a storm, and there was like a massive amount of sand that was lost. So we don't be really understand the dynamics. So we saw the engineer disappearing, and then suddenly we get massive growth, and, and some have extended like over a hundred people wide suddenly, those like two words together. Um, so, and we see the same in our monitoring research uh, concerning the soft sediment dynamics. Those get dumped on the coast during the monsoon. So somewhere in the beginning of the monsoon, yeah, like a meter of mud comes in. And then it gets taken out at the end of the machine again by the waves. But it also looks, so we've been monitoring, and, and uh, the idea of the dance was we trap that mud coming in. We, we stop the process of it the way it's taking it out. But then we see that in one year, a lot of mud comes in, and in the other, nothing. So, which turns out in non, no, no growth in our grid cells and erosion in the control blocks. So, if there's the, I have two years of monitoring, my results are, yeah, yearly dynamics that we are not fully understanding yet, uh, play the most important role. Yeah. But the grid cells are working. So, um, that is but if you put a lot of sand in the system, you'll be helping the system for quite a while. Yes, I think it would. Yeah, no, I think it would work, and you could even do. I'm not saying the sand ending, but I mean, we know how it's transported along the coast, right? And we can see from which drift for a cloud it is for the origin. So it would be kind of interesting to do something with it, but we couldn't mobilize the equipment from it. But I would also like to better understand yeah, the process there. Thank you. Okay, so it is my pleasure to welcome on stage the next speaker, which is Professor David Schumpel. He is a sitting professor at Leiden University in The Hague. He has a PhD obtained at UC Davis in 2008 for a work on conflict and cooperation within public uh, corporations, a uh, case study for the Municipal Water District of Southern California. He then was postdoctoral fellow at UC Berkeley from 2008 to 2010. And uh, he is blogging, he has a blog, uh, economics. He's author of two books on uh, water and economics. Uh, and we are eager to listen to his talk. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, good morning. Hello. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I um, am going to speak uh, kind of at a, a more philosophical level without actually being a philosopher. So I'm going to speak a little bit about the bigger picture of some of the topics here in your uh, this this symposium, and it's uh, and, and also I'm coming to this as a political economist who spent about uh, or actually my entire career from graduate school forward thinking and talking about communication. So 
I'm very, very pleased to see the communication track here, but I'm also going to make some comments based on my uh, ongoing intensive discussions with people on all different dimensions of the water uh, world, uh, because I think some of this feedback might in some ways help you with your own plans, your own ideas, your own work, uh, and make it more effective. My goal is to make it so, uh, and, and thank you very much to the organizers for having me here. I'm uh, very pleased always to be able to, to speak to people who are um, getting stuff done because I want to help them get that stuff uh, put into place or get it implemented. Uh, now, when it comes to, I was actually at a, a, in Estonia, was it Estonia? Uh, a year ago when they had a nature-based solutions conference. And, my, my, my first reaction was that we don't need nature-based solutions or solutions based in nature, but we need human solutions, because humans, in fact, are the ones that are making all these decisions, and as pretty much everybody here probably knows, uh, replacing a, a natural ecosystem with a human-built ecosystem is extremely ineffective and extremely uh, costly. And so, in some ways, a lot of the work we've been doing uh, as, as humans, our behavior or decisions, has been uh, to go against all of these great systems that nature set up for us, and now we're saying, oh, maybe we should do something to uh, you know, be humble before nature. Uh, and there are lots of interventions, including you know, sand machines and so on, but the scale at which nature operates is at least a thousand times, two orders of magnitude, three orders of magnitude greater than we can accomplish right now, even if we have nuclear power and everything, right? So, in fact, you know, we, we are, we've been missing this opportunity for centuries due to our hubris, uh, and now there's a little bit of a pullback, and let's say we can use nature, but I think uh, as a political economist, I would say, let's pull back some of those politicians and pull back some of those humans, uh, and then just in some ways leave nature alone. Uh, that would be my advice. Uh, and as we know, uh, climate change is, uh, of course, uh, what's now called, I think, appropriately, climate disruption, is not just uh, coming in uh, a little bit sooner than expected, but a little bit bigger than expected. And uh, some of my worst fears, uh, unfortunately, might be realized, uh, which means that where I live in Amsterdam might not be such a dry place in the uh, near future. So uh, I've been paying a lot of attention to this kind of topic. Uh, another thing I want to mention is that everybody in this room, of course, is uh, uh, what we call converted to the cause, right? You're actually in the room. And uh, the small minority of people here who actually understand the need for interdisciplinary communication, they understand the need to uh, talk to uh, policymakers, they understand the, the, the need to have realistic solutions, uh, that's great. But the other 99% of the population that's not in this room doesn't necessarily understand that. And that actually creates a problem because we need their agreement, we need their money, uh, we need their votes, et cetera, to, to move forward. And that is a real challenge. Uh, especially when we have some organizations, uh, the Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, my favorite, uh, some organizations that are totally incompetent at actually dealing with changes in this world, uh, and because they're self self secluded, uh, they don't, and also of course uh, subject to political uh, direction, they're not necessarily uh, up with the program of changing what they've been doing for several hundred years. So. Um, and, and the, the, the other part, the, the last thing I'm going to emphasize, just as, and I was just writing these notes because I was sharing all these things, and I'm updating my presentation, which I'll get to in a second, don't worry, uh, is that communication has been mentioned here a couple times, but communication is absolutely the most important thing you can think of, and I'll, I'll come up with this more as I go through, but when you publish a paper, that is not the end of your work, that is the start of your work, and uh, you need to go talk to other colleagues who haven't read your paper, who haven't heard your paper, you need to make it digestible, you need to talk to news reporters, and all of that is not natural for academics. We're used to sitting in our room, being left alone with our models and with our math, but we really do need to be out there talking to people, because otherwise, quite honestly, your work is wasted. Um, I just gave a talk um, on the weekend, on Saturday, uh, with our alumni, talking about a paper I wrote with, a, with a, another student. Um, it took us about two years to write it. It's called the History of the Dutch Drinking Water Sector, so if you're interested in that, uh, look it up. It's a fantastic paper, and it has a grand total of six downloads since it was published about three months ago. Now, uh, it's behind a paywall, and, and I've made it easy for pirates to find it and so on, but what we're talking about here is two years of work with, let's say, six downloads, and, and that is, I think, a little bit normal, right? The, the modal citation for a PhD dissertation is zero. So uh, that means that uh, if people even read your dissertation, which is unusual, then it's unlikely they'll ever use it. And if you're thinking about the importance of your work, 
then I, I think you should give yourself the benefit of trying to get it in front of people. So uh, that's what I'm going to uh, emphasize with this talk. There we go. Okay, so uh, what you've heard about me. Um, my con my blog has changed from auto economics to one-handed economists, if you're keeping track of that. Uh, but I still do uh, talk about uh, terrible failures of political politics. Um, but I've been working a lot on collective goods, uh, which is going to come through on this talk. So uh, today we're talking about this prompt. Um, and as I mentioned, you, your solutions, if they're too academic, they're not going to get out there. So uh, your your solutions, your work, your analysis, it needs to be accessible, understandable, feasible, actionable, and acceptable. And don't worry, I do actually find these in the next slide, if they're going to replace existing failing policies. So by accessible, I mean that uh, can non-academics even get to your papers, right? Uh, they're buried behind paywalls or some obscure place. If, if you can't find these things quickly, then that means no one else can, because people don't even know they're looking for your work. So making it available is actually really important. Uh, is it understandable? Are your assumptions just totally not going to work? I usually, I'm an economist. The vast majority of economics papers are not worth the first paragraph. We build a model. Okay, done. I'm done. So uh, avoid jargon, right? There's too much jargon in the paper. The lay, lay person can't pick it up. It's no sin to write a paper that a normal person, person can understand. Please, please just use normal language. You can use the jargon occasionally, but normal people will then be able to use your work. It has to be feasible. Many solutions, uh, you know, first uh, there's all these jokes, you know, uh, two econ economists are stuck in a boat in the middle of the ocean. They're, they're, all of their food and water is in cans. The economist says, first, assume a can opener. You know, you, don't, you can't assume things that just aren't there, right? So keep these things realistic. Um, and when you're talking about solutions, and that was what was coming up in your, in your talk this morning, you know, these, these solutions that are not actually, you know, working for the local situation. Oh, one way. Sorry. Okay. Um, and they have to be, they have to fit into local or and existing institutions. You just can't show up and say, I have got the solution for you. Uh, uh, back in the 1960s, the very smart agronomists went to Bali, they decided, they said, we have a solution for increasing your rice crop, you're going to have lots of food, you're going to use less water, et cetera, et cetera. They said, stop using uh, the traditional way of allocating water and planting uh, rice. If you don't know about the story, it's, uh, there's a book about it called Priests and Programmers, it's a great book. And basically, these, these uh, agronomists came in, and they had all these great solutions, which uh, did double the rice crop in the first year, and then everything failed in the next year because it turned out the old traditional magical ways of growing rice had a lot to do with uh, keeping pests at bay, right? And so the pests rose up and ate all of the rice, and they lost their whole crop. So the superstitious religious ceremonies they'd been using for a thousand years were actually well-conceived institutions in response to local conditions. And the engineers uh, who showed up, the aid consultants who showed up, hadn't been there for 15 minutes before they came up with a great new idea, which in fact was a terrible idea. So it has to fit within local institutions, and those are uh, something I work on all the time. So it's, it's just the, the rules and the norms that are in place in a local situation. And of course, they have to be acceptable. Now, this is the worst one of all, because the powerful, in many cases, do not like change. And the powerful will often stop good ideas because uh, either that will cost them money, or it will make them work harder, or they have to learn a whole new whatever, anything, paradigm of thinking. Uh, like I said, the core of engineers is in this category. And so, in that sense, uh, uh, your ideas will be stopped for no good reason except that change is uncomfortable for those who are benefiting from the current status quo. Um, and climate change or climate disruption is going to put a lot of weight on this because uh, the, the, the holdouts in the, in the failing policies are going to hold out, hold out, hold out, but the damage is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and I just uh, heard the other day about uh, the building of a, a brand new train track between Miami and I think it was Palm Beach, Florida. Now, if anybody's been paying attention, Miami is on the list of cities most likely to be underwater in the next 20 or 30 years. Uh, and building, you know, hard infrastructure in the middle of that area is quite amazing. But uh, you know, those people are when they put more money on the ground. Oh, and this is where the core of engineers is, is tragic. When you put more money on the ground, there's more to lose and therefore more to defend. And so the cost-benefit analysis that they use is that the, the dumber the idea of building your palace in a floodplain, the more likely it is the core of engineers are coming back and support your palace in the floodplain as opposed to don't build a palace in the floodplain, right? So it's kind of funny, but that's what they do. 
Okay, so what I'm saying is nothing new, right? You need to work harder than you want to, right? You need to have extramural partnerships. You have to have partnerships with non-academics. You have to have partners with people on the other floor. You have to have partners with people with, with different uh, uh, disciplinary backgrounds if you're going to get your ideas into real change. Uh, and that means the people skills. That means talking to, to each other. That's why coffee breaks are the most important part of the conference. Um, and so here's some of my brief comments on these various four sections for today. Um, the challenge. Okay, so water is a wicked problem, difficult to solve. There's a laser in there somewhere. No. Anyway, there's a footnote. So uh, it's a wicked problem, uh, and there because there's lots of things going on at once. Kind of life is like that. But um, what we have, I've identified three things which are the biggest problem. One is that uh, there's not as much water as we were used to, abundance. So it's abundance of fresh water, it's abundance of clean water, it's abundance of uh, uh, water cleaning services if you want, it's abundance of land to live on. We had abundance and now we don't because there's a lot of people on the planet, seven and a half billion going to 10 billion, and uh, all of those people, much more importantly, are consuming at a far higher rate than they were consuming before. So a lot of resources and uh, environmental services that we took for granted are, are stressed, taxed, uh, and under in trouble because that abundance, we have those, uh, we, 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 we took them for granted. Even the ocean, we used to say, as limitless as the ocean. We used to say, as limitless as sand on the, on, on the, on the beach. And now, literally, sand is in shortage in many parts of the world, Singapore being the number one place. Uh, with the uh, sand mafia. So, um, we also don't know where we are. We have missing data, right? Uh, in the majority, of the, if anybody works on groundwater, you know we have almost no idea how much groundwater is out there. We don't usually know the weight rate at which groundwater is being taken away. We don't know uh, what's going to happen with climate systems based on loss of not uh, stationarity. Uh, we don't know, know water quality in most taps in most cities in the, on the world because it's usually not tested at the tap, it's tested at the drink water plant. So data is missing on, on all kinds of different directions. And yes, that's a good idea to get more data, but it's also, I think, first, a, a, a reason why we should be humble about what we know, because usually we don't know. And then third, um, the, the, the area that I work on, and I'll say a little bit more about this, because this is my contribution to your knowledge, it'll be done on the next slide, is that there's overlapping uh, 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 consumption on the private side, which creates benefits, and then creates a cost on the public side, or on the common side. The most uh, common example of this is burning fossil fuels. Everybody's happy to fly. Uh, on an airplane, get in an airplane to go somewhere, everyone's happy to get on their car and drive somewhere. That private consumption of those fossil fuels results in GHG emissions that affect the commons of our global atmosphere and can literally put a country underwater. A country that had no idea what climate change was, that may not be driving cars or flying planes, that country is now gone because of that overlap between the private and the commons. And in, this, in the water sector, that is an ongoing uh, situation that is getting dramatically more relevant and dramatically more complicated because uh, water is the vector on which climate change is driving, right? So, let's talk about the comments for a second. Uh, this is me being the, the professor, so take your notebooks out. We'll do, we're going to make a box, okay? Now, in our box, we've got two by two, and we have two columns. And the question is, is this good excludable, or is this good non-excludable? Right? Excludable means I'm holding this, you cannot hold it, I'm holding it. Non-excludable is I'm talking, you can all hear it. Right? So is it excludable or not? Now another question we have is, is it viable or subtractable or non-viable? As, as in, if I drink the water, it's gone, you can't use it. Or if I say something, then if you hear it, it doesn't mean that someone else can't hear it also. So is it viable or non-viable? Now from these two different characteristics, we can do the entire universe of political economy, and that is that we'll talk about private goods, we'll talk about public goods, which is not to be confused with public schools, or public education, or, or public housing, or public, any of those things. This is economic stuff, jargon talk here. So what we have is private good, which is what you're used to, it's the phone that you're holding in your hand. It's a public good, which is uh, the non-rival, non-excludable my talk right now, it's a public good, you're welcome. Uh, but then we have things like uh, these two more interesting things called club goods, the door is shut, you're in the club. You're excluded. If you're not in the club, the doors keep you out. And then we have the common pool good, which is where all the action is. That's where all the fun stuff is. And it's because it's not excludable. Everybody can get to it, but it's rival in the sense that if, if someone uses it, then you can't have it. We know this is true with groundwater, obviously. We know this is true with um, uh, uh, budgets, 
the, the Dutch just had Kuchestad, right? Everybody's fighting over that pot of money. Who's going to get some more money for them, for their, uh, uh, their priorities? Who's going to get less money? So that's the commons. And the commons is most, where most of human, uh, success and failure shows up, by the way. So, the reason this is important is because economists always talk about, often talk about, that excludable column. They talk about where markets work, right? Because we know that markets are very good at allocating with prices and property rights, uh, you know, whether it's a phone, whether it's a house, whether it's a parking place, we know that markets are very good at that. But there's this whole other part of the world, which is the, the non-market side, the non company Doors open, you can come in, So we have the non excludable side of the world, which is where you have political management necessary, or if you're the fan of Eleanor Ostrom and that entire school of thinking, which is where I spend most of my time, you're interested in how the community will manage its resources, the community will manage its goods. And what this means is that you have to take both politics and economics into account. Uh, I do this. Now, you may not be thinking this because you're, you know, you're a technical person or a scientist, but this is going to affect your work. And if you're working in, in the commons and you're not thinking about the market or you think you work in the market, but actually work in the commons, then you might have a lot of uh, misinterpretations of the governance questions that are facing you. So this is the framework that I teach all the time. This is the framework that I'm going to use a little bit to talk about these major water uh, topics. And then, um, you know, maybe you can use it for your, for your own work, and, and if you have any questions, obviously, please contact me. I'm easy to find. So, and in general, please contact me. I'm easy to find. I love communication. Okay, so, now let's talk about uh, water, food, and energy security. So, the first thing is, as everybody said, talk about the nexus. I hate that word. It's a stupid word. Uh, it's not a strategy, uh, and especially since if you, walk, if you manage the nexus, then you're leaving out all the other 72 words that you can hy uh, hyphenate after water climate change, community, childhood development, everything can be hyphenated after this thing. It's a nexus. So, but we know is that energy is by far the most important word in this sector, uh, in this, this triumvirate, because it, there's a lot of money involved. Uh, and uh, that is one reason why climate disruption is uh, not slowing down, it's getting worse, because the people that like uh, using energy are uh, agree with people that like selling energy, fossil energy, that it's a good idea to use as much fossil energy as possible. And um, all of our good intentions and the Paris Accord notwithstanding, uh, we're not doing pretty much anything to lower the consumption of fossil energy. What that means is that we're, uh, all of the worst case scenarios of climate change might be the medium case scenarios of climate change. Uh, I'm a big fan, unfortunately, of the uh, not one meter by 2100, but more like uh, nine meters of sea level rise by 2100. Uh, I won't be around to see Amsterdam and the Netherlands go underwater, but uh, that kind of uh, possibility is something that I think is not taken seriously enough. Uh, second, or third, uh, water is the vector on which this disruption will arrive, right? We know we're going to be getting uh, bigger storms, we're going to get longer droughts. Almost anything you can think of as water related is going to get worse with climate disruption. And third, uh, food, of course, uh, uh, uses both water and energy. Uh, water will end up being, I believe, the constraining uh, uh, resource. Uh, the most uh, relevant example I can think of right now is, is and I just thought about the other day, the rate at which we are mining groundwater from aquifers that we use for food production is, is unprecedented. And by definition, mining groundwater, unsustainable uh, use of groundwater, means that water will not be there. Right now, we have seven and a half billion people in the planet who are consuming a, uh, statistically speaking, mostly vegetarian-based diet as they switch over to meat-based diet because it tastes better, uh, and all kinds of other superstitions. Uh, then the water consumption per capita is going to rise. We're also going to 10 billion people, and that water is not coming back. It will be in the ocean, which is handy, unless you want to grow something. And so, in that sense, we might actually uh, see more famines where uh, and, and food shortages, and depending on the politics, uh, so famines, because uh, the politics is going to determine that, uh, based on uh, the rain fa fails, the monsoon fails, and the groundwater isn't there anymore. And therefore, you can't go to your insurance policy to grow your crop. And so those kinds of crop failures are going to become much more frequent because the water just isn't there. Uh, and this is something that is, I think, uh, only getting worse. Um, and so, 
I'm going to say a little bit of a, a policy that's failing, and I'm going to try and pull it up hope about policies that are succeeding in each of these sectors. So the failures we're having is, is our countries that are mining their groundwater for so-called food security. Saudi Arabia is a world champion at this mistake. Uh, when they should be leaving that groundwater because when they need it and they should be trading for food as a way of getting food security. Um, we have governed policies, uh, the common agricultural policy, the United States agricultural policy are both disasters at telling farmers, grow this one crop, we'll pay you a lot of money. Guess what? All the farmers grow up that one crop, they get a monoculture, the market is totally disrupted, there is almost no uh, hedging against risk. The government itself is coordinating farmers to fail as a group. So these kinds of policies are long-standing, they're rich countries, and they're ongoing failures because uh, there are uh, members of the, there are, there are all, uh, political and economic actors that prefer it that way, usually because they get access to very cheap inputs, <laughs> right, the big trade, uh, agricultural trading corporations, for example. Uh, the farmers themselves, they bear the brunt of the cost of failures. Uh, success. I'm a, I'm a little bit uh, radical here in terms of saying anything decentralized, but compared to what we are seeing uh, with, with centralization of, of energy management and centralization of, of uh, water, I think uh, decentralized uh, types of solutions where the benefits and the costs, they show up in one location, so the people that at that location can, can manage and, and balance benefits and costs are much better than when it gets centralized and one group is screwed at, uh, uh, sorry, one group is treated unfairly uh, compared to uh, the other group which is benefiting usually through some kind of political maneuver. I wrote two papers on desalination, by the way, which is where these kinds of things come up. Because uh, desalination usually benefits a small population at a cost to the majority. Uh, water sanitation and ecosystems. So, uh, the solution to pollution used to be dilution, but now there's not enough dilution around, right? So, even the, Pacific, the, the oceans are full of plastic, there's not enough dilution power of the plastic. Uh, ecosystems are dying from almost every direction. We have thermal pollution, chemical pollution, biological pollution. Um, uh, as I mentioned at the top, replacing ecosystem services is extremely expensive. We're talking at least 100 to 1, and it's, 100, it's almost like an infinity because, of course, we were given these endowments of ecosystems and totally uh, had no clue about how valuable they were until we started to try and replace them, and then we figured out how expensive that was. Um, my favorite point here, you might have seen it already, is that uh, you know men, uh, for, sperm counts are down by 50%, so men like to have lots of vigor and children, and unfortunately there's so many chemicals in our water supply based on endocrine disruptors that men are going to be very not so vigorous. And you know um, it's not going to get a lot of attention until very powerful politicians can't have babies with their young wives, and then they'll say, maybe we should do something about this, finally. So, uh, I, I hate to say it, but you know, going directly for the most important aspect of a male identity might be the way to get policy change. I would, if you have any results on this, please send it to me. I want to magnify it, because we need these results as soon as possible, because a lot of men are not paying attention. So, failures. Um, failure to pay for pollute, right? That's one of the, 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 the key aspects of the Water Framework Directive, is that polluters should pay. That is uh, clearly not happening in many circumstances, uh, even though it is absolutely affordable, right? This is the saddest thing. It is not that expensive to clean wastewater. It is not that expensive for farmers to change their behavior. Uh, a, a, a paper that I love was, was written by, um, I can't remember exactly, but it was a, a conference I heard about in Conigan, uh, and it was a paper that said, the cost of pig farmers in the United States complying with the Clean Water Act for which they are exempt. The Clean Water Act was in place since the early 1970s. And immediately, farmers were exempt from all of these conditions because farmers you know, are too poor, they grow food, they feed people, etc. It's all kinds of political lobbying. The cost of those farmers complying with the Clean Water Act, which is to remove one of the largest sources of pollution in the United States, groundwater pollution, surface water pollution, is five cents per kilo of pig. Now, I don't care if you eat pig, but five cents per kilo is not very much. And the farmers are saying, oh, we have to make it cheaper. But I don't think the consumers actually care. And the regulators are asleep because the cost of, of, of saving those ecosystems from this particular kind of pollution is actually quite low. Um, so in that sense, that's why I'm saying this. There's a lot of lost opportunities. People just not even looking into the numbers. The cost, for example, of a carbon tax, by the way, is um, it's a roughly, I think it's less than 10 cents a liter uh, for gasoline. And, you know, that's more than zero, but it's it's not very high. It doesn't make the world collapse. 
Uh, and you can look at gasoline prices from one country to the next and see much greater changes of price than 10 cents a liter. But we, for example, have decided not to save the planet because it's not worth paying 10 cents a liter more for gasoline. That's, I think, going to turn into a real tragedy. I, was, oh, I wish we had done that. Um, ecosystems are barely monitored, let alone managed. We have the massive data problems I mentioned. Uh, and they're dying rapidly. When the coral systems go out, then we lose, uh, of course, a, a huge part of our biodiversity. Uh, we also lose uh, a good chunk of the, of the source of food for uh, hundreds of millions of people to be conservative, uh, as well as those nice things we like to swim around. So uh, this stuff is happening very, very fast. Um, successes in water sanitation and ecosystems is closing the loop. Singapore tends to manage its water from the rain all the way to very little discharge or everything they have is managed. Uh, Singapore is, is unique in some ways, but not unique in other ways. Of course, they're small and rich, but they also focus their attention on water because they see water as an issue of national security. Israel, you can say similar things, but Israel has some very big problems with its neighbors, uh, so I'm not going to cite them as a good source. And then, uh, head, head, how do you say it? Is that how you say it, Holden? Yeah, so the, the, this is the folder on the Dutch uh, uh, Belgian border, Flemish border, uh, and it was uh, foldered in 1907. Uh, and as you know, the Dutch are very proud about making land, not giving it back. Uh, and this was a massive success in terms of uh, allowing this folder to be flooded. Uh, it was part of a complicated deal to restore shipping to Antwerp, which is maybe not a great idea, but it doesn't matter. The point is, is that you need to sometimes say, we're going to lose some productive agricultural land in order to restore some of those ecosystem services, which are, by the way, quite useful. So there are successes out there also. Weather extremes and hazards, as I mentioned, these are only going to get worse. Um, that's what I just said. So uh, now, what's interesting, of course, is that our ancestors, the hunter-gatherers, when there was a tsunami or when there was a flood or when there was whatever, they would just move away. You know, they were walking all over the place. They weren't necessarily living in condominiums on the on the ocean front, or they weren't worried about their car that was parked, uh, you know, right in front of their house. Uh, and so uh, we have, I think, to confront a fact right now, which is that uh, some of our uh, infrastructure and some of our major cities are going to have to be abandoned. Uh, because either the temperatures just get too high in the daytime, this is maybe the case for central India, of course the Middle East, uh, or we might have to abandon them uh, for rising floodwaters, like I mentioned, Miami's on the list, Jakarta is way ahead of Miami on that list, uh, and, um, uh, and, and, and go live somewhere else. If you as an individual were deciding where to live or why buy property, I would you know, ask yourself, is this place going to be here in 50 years? Uh, of course, what I mentioned is the rich, who have most of their wealth tied up in, in land, in real estate, don't like this. So the rich tell the politicians, you have to defend my land. The politicians say, we have to defend our community. Notice that the land is not the same as the community. This community can believe, right? But the politicians want to defend the land, which belongs to the rich people, who are funding the politicians. And that is how you get a lot of really dumb ideas, like building seawalls, or build it back stronger, all this stuff that the Americans talk about. Uh, here we go. Uh, and Jakarta seawall, I think, you know, the water right now is about this far below the seawall, and they're going to defend that. I think, you know, what if, you know, they should just write off uh, old, old Jakarta Batavia. You know, the World Heritage Site is now underwater. It's an underwater park. Uh, and that means facing reality. And, and there's some dictators that have moved our cities to in the middle of nowhere kind of stuff. I'm not talking about that. That's just like silly dictatorship. I'm talking about actually going somewhere that is a viable place to live, not just based on someone's whim. Uh, early warning systems, of course, are uh, uh, increasingly more useful and increasingly more helpful. Uh, the, um, there's, there's lots of examples of these uh, systems uh, giving people more time to respond, even to earthquakes, which are not climate related, uh, but uh, and, and tsunamis and so on. Those systems are, are getting better. Uh, and this is, again, a data situation. We have to spend a lot more time on training and relocation. There is almost no effort put in training because everybody hopes it doesn't happen. In Houston, I think they mentioned, I think the statistic was that Houston was having a one in 500 year storm or hurricane, the most recent hurricane, except it's the third one in 500 year hurricane to show up in three years. So I think that their baseline measurement was a little bit wrong and uh, and their ideas of how to, to, to withdraw were, were uh, uh, not tested and so there was much more chaos. Uh, Jakarta, not Jakarta, Katrina, the, the, the 2004 uh, hurricane in, in New Orleans, of course, showed a lot of Americans that they had no clue what they were doing, and that did result in a lot more training, but everywhere in the world they need to be doing this. Um, 
In New Jersey, uh, after uh, Superstorm Sandy, you know, super, never seen before, bigger than ever, we're going oh, to run out of words, right? We're going to get a super, super good <laughs> kept up that. The longest word possible storm is going to show up in, in the near future and say, well, we've never seen this before. And, and in, in New Jersey is right next to New York, and, and uh, Superstorm Sandy uh, hit both of them very hard, and, and they are now, after uh, years of work, succeeding in getting people to sell their houses and turn those houses into wetlands. And that is a very interesting, complicated problem, wicked problem indeed, but there are actually people on the ground that are getting stuff done. So, uh, and these are just news stories, of course, but everybody might have their own version of success, and I, as I said, tell me about them because I like to uh, advertise this stuff on my blog. Now, um, bringing, bridging from science to implementation is, I think, the most uh, important topic here, according to me, because this is where I work. And it's, uh, like I said, if your work is done but it doesn't get out there, then it's going to be uh, a loss of, uh, of, of your actual uh, hard effort. So academic publication is not the same as communication, as I just mentioned. Uh, academics, for sure, can, should and, and will learn from talking to practitioners and vice versa. This means, you know, uh, uh, it's a, just an ongoing dialogue. You'll learn from each other. I've, I've talked over the, these years to my blog to thousands of people. They taught me more than I would have ever learned in class. Um, and practitioners, they lack strategy often. Often what they do is they just, what they were doing before, except a little bit better, or a little bit bigger, or a little bit more left, or a little bit more right, a little bit more red, whatever that is, they're, they're, they're incrementalists. And so in some ways, if you have a strategy for them that might say, what you're doing is a bad idea, you can be very polite about this, but uh, maybe you should try a pilot, or you should try, as, as someone said, where someone else tried something different, and that might work for you. Those kinds of suggestions can be, can be helpful, but that's only the, the start. If they, number one, they have to listen to you. Number one, you can get in the room with them. Number two, they have to listen to you. Number three, they have to have the ability to actually do something. Uh, and number four, then they have to convince other people to do something. So it takes a lot of work to get change within any kind of practical organization that's doing any version of water management. Uh, and so they are usually get business as usual, but I honestly think that the more time you put into that, the more likely it is you're actually going to have a positive impact with your work. Um, most economists have failed on this one. They, they uh, don't understand uh, uh, the difference between risk and uncertainty. Um, there's a, a, a very fine paper out there called uh, Fat Sale Risks by Mar Marty Weissman, who basically says that economists and their cost-benefit analysis, uh, analysis of climate change have so monumentally screwed up the numbers that pretty much every economic study about the uh, benefits of acting on climate change is wrong by several orders of magnitude, which means that almost all the policy advice that economists have been giving to governments is wrong as well. Uh, that's a little bit tragic because that might mean the difference between the end of human civilization and uh, the good life, but that is a fact. The IPCC uh, has been too conservative. As you know, they go for uh, the lowest, uh, the, the consensus opinion on any given scientific question. Uh, I don't. I know there are more radical opinions out there, but the consensus opinion in some cases becomes the most aggressive scenario on some people's minds. And as I mentioned earlier, I don't think that the IPCC discusses the most radical scenario uh, nearly as much as they should, because it turns out that those radical scenarios are turning out to be the average scenarios. Uh, and a lot of people are not planning for that, and they're going to get very upset. Army Corps of Engineers, forget it. So, um, Deltaris, when they are working, and I'm, 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 I, I'm not going to bless Deltaris across the board, but it is an organization which has the benefit of constantly trying to work with clients and bridge from theory into practice. That is a blueprint I get behind. Um, and they need to be uh, working on uh, actual risks with clients that are actually open to new ways of doing things with, and of course, field testing their work. I think that's pretty much, would you agree with that, roughly? Roughly. Yeah. Okay, because I'm putting a lot of caveats in there. Because the example of uh, New Orleans was that when Del Taurus and all the other Dutch consultants showed up, and the Americans said, we want to build it back stronger, they're like, okay, it's your money. And then, you know, they didn't, in fact, they didn't evacuate the lower ninth district, they didn't evacuate the most vulnerable areas of New Orleans because of local politics. And so, yes, they took all the money, they put all the studies together, very brilliant studies of the next failure that's going to happen in New Orleans. So in that sense, you know, you have to have good clients. So here's my bottom line. Um, Water-related topics are all getting worse simultaneously. No matter where you work, your, your work is needed. Um, 
We have problems with outdated institutions, mismatched costs and benefits. Some people get the benefits and others people are going to bear those costs, usually poor people, right? Um, an ongoing failure to prioritize long range planning over short term consumption. That's like the human race. Um, so, and this is me, you know, being uh, as optimistic as possible. We're going to have very difficult lives if we're still alive. Uh, but our communities are actually going to be the foundation of our future. Our, the communities that organize well, that manage their local water resources, whether it's uh, groundwater or against floods, they're going to do better than communities that are worse off. But the ones that are not doing well are actually going to invade, attack, uh, or, or need uh, bailouts and help from people that are still around. The, we're going to, in my opinion, our lives as, as the human race is, you know, our, 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 the average quality of life is peaking right now. It's going to go down because we're going to have to spend so much of our resources defending ourselves against climate change that we will have not as many resources for new iPhones or uh, faster cars or bigger houses. We're just going to have to have smaller houses with higher uh, foundations. We're going to have to have phones that are waterproof and tsunami proof, etc. We're going to have to spend so much money on defending ourselves that we won't have as much of the consumption that we've grown used to. Um, yeah. <laughs> I went way too long. I'm sorry. Blah, blah, blah. Sorry, I took my uh, question time. So if you want to tell me shut up, not the phone. <laughs> uh, well, we do have time for just one question. If there's any burning questions. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. Quite alarmist, I would say. Uh, Quite sorry. Uh, what's the word? Alarming. Alarming. That's Alarming. Yes. Sure. That's my so, job. Uh, I understand you want to be a bit provocative, maybe to uh, to uh, generate a bit more thinking around these problems. But what are the solutions? Okay, we're a consumption society. We should reduce consumption, perhaps. Uh, nobody is sure that it will uh, reduce climate change because perhaps it's just a chaotic process which just has geophysical. Uh, 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 Reasons and not uh, that we burn more fossil fuels, nobody knows exactly. What I think we know is fossil fuels. Uh, we know. We're not going to have that discussion, but what's your question? So, what to do now? Oh, what to do? Yeah. So, like I said, uh, get to know your neighbors because if the water is outside your front door, they might have a boat, you need a boat. Um, if, 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 uh, if I could do one magic wand thing, what to do, I would have a change of government policy that would reduce the amount of consumption that we have. Uh, the, this is a carbon tax kind of policy. Um, and because the, and the reason I would say that is because the vast majority of humans are too busy to worry about you know, their role in climate change and, and how they should be changing their behavior. Some of them say, I'm going to be a vegetarian, I'm not going to have kids. You know, those people are the enlightened ones, but they're a very small percentage. So the vast majority of people, if you change the price of consuming fossil fuels, will consume fewer fossil fuels. Uh, of course, there's countries out there, some of you might be from them, that subsidize the consumption of fossil fuels, which would be more crazy. But uh, whatever that is, that kind of big change uh, would result in many people changing their behavior and reduce the stresses from the overconsumption. So that would be my, my dream. Uh, it's very simple, it generates revenue, it's pro poor, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but as I mentioned, rich people like burning oil. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Zevin. That was a very interesting and very detailed presentation and another keen example of the bridging science with implementation in the field of water, food, and energy security. So that now brings us to the close of this session, of our introductory session, and we're now going to proceed to a very short break. We would love for you to be back at 11.05. And then we can begin our, uh, our theme sessions. The first being the bridging science with implementation and the water, food, and energy security session. Uh, for the moderators, I would very much appreciate that you meet with me during the break. And uh, the evaluators, if you can just be back just before the session starts, we can distribute the evaluation forms. But that's all for now. Please enjoy the break and thank you. Enjoy. <laughs>